Howdy, and welcome to the heart of downtown El Paso. This is San Jacinto Plaza, a meeting place and a public park for over a century. It's also called Alligator Park for the original live alligators that once lived here. And they lived here for decades in this big fountain right behind. And we still call it Alligator Park, but it just ain't the same. We're now going to take a tour of some of the sites of downtown El Paso that were instrumental in the Mexican Revolution. Mexico is about a mile to the south that way, but that revolution was planned right here in El Paso. Pancho Villa purchased a lot of the Army's equipment and clothing here in El Paso, sometimes paying in gold that he stole from Mexican banks. It was a rough time. And from about 1910 to 1930, this could be a dangerous place to be. And now here is El Paso's greatest historian on the Mexican Revolution, Fred Morales. Hi, Leon. It's great to be here to talk about what I consider El Paso's most historical events. And they happened during the Mexican Revolution era from 1910 to 1920. Even though we're here about a mile away from the U.S.-Mexico boundary, on May 1911, Florentino Espinosa was sitting here on a bench and all of a sudden he's hit by a stray bullet. It, it hits his left leg and he suffers a flesh wound and he's taken to the hospital. During that era, people were even warned to stay away from the danger zone, but they wouldn't listen in Chihuahuita all the way to Smeltertown people would just line the U.S. Uh, border and just stand on top of railroad cars and look over into Juarez and witness the battle. A lot of buildings in this vicinity were also hit by stray bullets. The Mills building, the old federal courthouse that used to be there, the Sheldon Hotel, which doesn't exist no more, the El Paso and Southwestern building, they all suffered uh, bullet wounds. Fred, who was Pancho Villa and how much time did he actually spend here in El Paso? Pancho Villa was a legendary bandit, but he turned into a revolutionary supporting Francisco Madero and he made him a captain. Villa was here in the area from 1908 to 1916. After the raid on Columbus, there are no records to show that he ever came back to El Paso. But in 1908, he worked in the Segundo Barrio cleaning pens of a lot of cocks and, and roosters. Uh, around 1911, he did a lot of uh, uh, shopping in this area. He liked to frequent restaurants to eat. He liked to eat in ice cream parlors. He liked to socialize in a lot of places where people could go and meet him and they could discuss about the revolution. Did Villa like to talk about the res revolution or was he rather hesitant, reticent? He liked to talk only among his inner circle of friends. He had a lot of distrust for outsiders, but he was a very socializing person. He liked to dance, he liked to talk, he, he liked to just socialize with people of all walks of life. Did he speak English? Very little. He's, the Spanish also that he spoke was not Castilian, it was uh, the PNH type of Spanish. Fred, Pancho Villa is primarily known for his raid on Columbus, New Mexico. But, you know, up until that time, Pancho Villa liked Americans and really talked about them, I mean, associated with them well and seemed to get along. Do you have any idea what happened? Villa liked to come to Fort Bliss and socialize a lot with the top brass. Some of his best friends were uh, General Pershing and um, General Scott in particular. They were good friends, even up to the, the raiding Columbus. Why did Pancho Villa attack Columbus? There were about four or five main reasons for Villa uh, citing the town for the raid. Before that, he had planned to attack Presidio, Texas, but that plan was aborted, and they chose Columbus as an alternate site the main reasons for the raid was that Villa was uh, not recognized anymore by the Woodrow Wilson administration and 
that presidency recognized the Carranza government, Villa's enemy, and they also imposed an arms embargo on the army of Villa. Villa no longer could get any supplies from the U.S. side, which before he would buy by the train loads. Uh, also, the Columbus town had a merchant named Ravel who had, who had shortchanged Villa with uh, bad ammunition. And also, the town of Columbus was a good place to attack because it was so isolated and it was only maintained by a small garrison. And they decided that this would be the best place because when they attacked early in the morning of March 9, 1916, the whole town was caught by surprise and the raid lasted less than two hours and Villa in actuality suffered a lot of casualties. But prior to that, Villa was a well-known individual, a liked individual, spent a lot of time in El Paso. Yes, uh, Villa would always like to socialize primarily on El Paso Street. Prior to the raid on Columbus, 1910, 1911, 1912, Villa was a very popular figure here in El Paso. Yes, Villa was always popular here in El Paso and he always made the front page headlines of the local newspapers. He would like to go to places where he could meet with uh, some of his patriots also that were from Chihuahua here as, a, as refugees. He would also go during the time after the Battle of Ojinaga. He sent even his wife Luz Corral to Fort Bliss to supply him with blankets and clothing. And Villa would always even hang out with the politicians, especially Charles Kelly, who was mayor here around 1911. Obviously, he had to have turned against Americans, and there, there must have been a reason. You mentioned Sam Rabel a few moments ago. Uh, Sam Rabel was a, a merchant in, in, in Columbus, New Mexico, as I understand it, and had cheated Villa in, in some transactions. Yes, and it's ironic that during the raid on Columbus, Sam Rebel escaped being killed because the day before he caught a train to El Paso to come see a dentist for an appointment. Do you know Sam Rebel's buried in a Jewish cemetery here in El Paso? In Concordia Cemetery? In Concordia Cemetery. And his family, the Rebels, they had a business here also on McGoffin Street for quite some time. Okay, Fred, you're the historian and a very good one. Why don't we why don't we take a tour of downtown El Paso and just talk about these some of these places where Pancho Villa visited at one time or another? Let's go, Liam. All right. You know, I heard Okay, Fred, we're in downtown El Paso now, which, without any question, this is the most historic site in the community. And tell me a little bit about who was this guy right here? Well, Fray Garcia de San Francisco arrived in this region in 1659, and he's responsible for the creation of the first mission to Christianize the Manso Indians here in this area. And this actually is the core of downtown El Paso, but as time moved along, let's move it up, say, to the Mexican Revolution. What was here then? By then, there was a five-story structure here called the Sheldon Hotel right. that uh, predated the plaza. It burned down in 1929, but during the Mexican Revolution, it sheltered a lot of soldiers of fortune, a lot of sympathizers of Francisco Madero, and a lot of war correspondence from throughout the nation. A lot of major uh, newspapers covered the Battle of Juarez in May of 1911, and this is where they were headquarters. And can you tell me a few things about what might have happened here in this old, I mean, I, I can see these revolutionaries are gathering together, they're plotting this and they're plotting that, they're occasionally arguing with one another. Yeah. Can you tell me some things that might have happened here? Well, the area sheltered a lot of spies for both Porfirio Diaz and for Francisco Madero. But after the battle, a famous incident occurred here when Pancho Villa came across the border and tried to confront an Italian soldier of fortune named Garibaldi because he had started 
a, a big argument in Juarez by calling Villa a coward and Villa resented that. He came over with two pistols to have a deal with Garibaldi. But before that could materialize here in the lobby of the Sheldon, he was intercepted by Secret Service agents and Mayor Charles Kelly, who put Pancho Villa in a car and they took him back to the International Bridge. And said, come back and see us some other time. Yes. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> You're a good guy, Pancho, but not today. Yes, correct. <laughs> But what happened? What later happened to the old Sheldon Hotel? Well, a, a fire occurred in 1929. About right here, a lot of firemen were trying to put it out, but they were unsuccessful. And after the building burned down, the Hilton Hotel went up, and later it became the Plaza Hotel. And this structure in itself is also of historical significance. This, to us, is almost where the revolution began. Yes, uh, a, a lot of the... Uh, the plotting, uh, a lot of the planning for the Battle of Juarez occurred here and at Madero's headquarters across from Smelter Town. Yeah. You can walk into this place, as I understand it, almost any time of the day, and you would see soldiers of fortune, <laughs> you would see revolutionaries, you would see government secret agents sitting around trying to tune in on the talk. It, it would have been, if you could have had a camera, it would have been the most fascinating place in the world to have been. Well, Leon, why don't we take up down South El Paso Street where we have a lot of other popular sites pertaining to the Mexican Revolution era. Let's go. Okay. And here we have the old Camino Real Hotel, Fred. This is uh, imagine originally a, simply a long line of one-story buildings, a dirt street. In 1912, they decided to build the largest hotel between Los Angeles and the East Coast. And it was 12 stories high, a marvelous hotel. Became known as the Camino Real. You could have walked in here at any particular time, found Pancho Villa, and Fred, what else happened here during the Mexican Revolution? Well, during the Battle of Ojinaga in late, uh, nine, no, in early 1914, Pancho Villa created the largest exodus of refugees to the El Paso region, far surpassing the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. And one of the main refugees was Ruiz Terrazas, who fled here. He rented the entire first floor, and later from there, he moved to the Fall Mansion. And also a lot of important cattlemen would come here and congregate, and they had a lot of special interests in the state of Chihuahua. And some of them were even kidnapped by Pancho Villa during the punitive expedition and were held for ransom. Right. One of the fascinating things is, that you mentioned Tarasas and the others, you got to walked in here maybe at any particular time, day or night, and you'd encountered Pancho Villa, you'd, uh, Pascual Orozco, uh, Francisco Madero, all of the real greats of the Mexican Revolution, and they took over this entire hotel here. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's really one of the most unique, remarkable experiences in El Paso history. It is, and also on this block was located the LNA Theater, and in 1934, it premiered the movie Viva Villa, starring uh, Wallace Berry. In the 1970s at the Plaza, Terry Savalas made another movie on Pancho Villa, and the wife of Pancho Villa came to its premiere, uh, Luz Corral, and it was a big turnout. Miss Corral was quite a remarkable lady. What did she look like? She was light complected. Light she had green eyes. Uh, she was nicknamed La Huera by Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa had what a nickname for all, all his wives. But what does it mean? It means English? somebody that's light complected. Okay. <laughs> Villa liked women of all shades. Luz Corral was the first, as I understand it, of Villa's wives. Is that not correct? I've heard of others. <laughs> I've heard of others too. <laughs> and others came later. In fact, I think she was the one I met at the, at the museum down in uh, Chihuahua City. Uh, I didn't realize she was Villa's wife until I was standing there talking to her. And at that point, I froze and just simply couldn't say another word. But she was a charming woman. But here in El Paso, 
Sometimes during parades, she would paint the side of her car saying, Viva, Viva, Viva on the side doors and so on. A, a remarkable lady in, uh, in, in her own right. And al although Via had a lot of wives, she without any question was his favorite and uh, certainly his most prominent. Uh, she felt that Via loved her than any of all the wives that Via had. When she lived here on the 600 block of North Oregon, she used to peddle uh, candies on a lot of the streets here in downtown El Paso to make a living. She at one time even went to the Fort Bliss refugee camp in 1914 and offered them over a thousand dollars to help them get clothes and uh, uh, many essentials that the refugees needed, blankets, uh, pillows, you name it. I'll be darned. And did she get the money? Uh, she got it from uh, from from Pancho Villa because he had raised some monies and Villa was a compassionate man. He felt sorry for the refugees and he offered to help them in any way possible. How do you explain the complexities of Villa? Do you can see Villa as a very friendly, charming, remarkable man who would pat you on the back, who would help you sincerely? But at the same time, there was also another Via who could be cruel and cold-hearted. How do you explain the, the contradiction between the two Vias? Via had a good and a bad side. If you got along well with him, he could be your best friend. He could, but if you double-crossed him, he could be a revengeful beast. That was his nature, and he's known for that even during the Mexican Revolution. Like, both sides of the revolution, he also committed atrocities like the Federals, but that was due to the, the nature of any kind of revolution. Yeah, Villa was such, he was a contradictory individual. Contradictory in the sense, if you wanted to see him as a saint, as a generous, good-hearted individual, there's plenty of evidence for that. Yes. But if you wanted to see him as something akin to a murderous individual, somebody who had no pity, no mercy, there's evidence for that too. And how do you explain the contradiction? Villa was a very complex figure. It was very hard to peg him, but he had a good side and a dark side. When he was in his good times, in good humor, uh, Villa would project a good positive atmosphere and attract a lot of people and he would be adored by the public. But on the other hand, when Villa was double crossed or if anybody said anything negative about him, he had a firecracker temper that he would go immediately and solve the problem. During the revolution, he displayed on occasion a lot of atrocities. His real name was Doroteo Arango Arambula. He grew up in a ranch or was born in a ranch in northern Durango called La Coyotada. And then he grew up in an area called San Juan del Rio where he got baptized and there is where became, he became a bandit. He had to flee a ranch from a wealthy hacendado that had really uh, tried to rape his sister. Leon. This is a very important historical corridor that has to do a lot with the Mexican Revolution. Why don't we continue going down the street and check out some other sites? I think it's a good idea. All right. Fred, tell me a little bit about this area in terms of the Mexican Revolution. What are some, what are some of these buildings here? Well, up ahead is the old St. Charles Hotel, or the old Merrick Building. Okay. And it housed the Sheldon Payne Arms Company in the 1910s. One of the main suppliers of the, for firearms for the Mexican Revolution. Firearms, ammunition, uh, you name it. And across the street also, another supplier was Heyman Crump, the well-known Jewish merchant. He supplied many blankets also and shoes and clothing and uniforms for the army of Francisco Villa. And also in this structure, it housed the uh, Planter Hotel in January 1911. And here, Abraham Gonzalez opened the first office called the Provisional Government of Mexico. And later they moved into larger quarters and they established a junta in the Capels building located several blocks east of us. And who was Abraham Gonzalez? Abraham Gonzalez was a follower of Francisco Madero and he headed 
the Chihuahua state area in terms of supporting Madero. And he also was responsible for convincing Francisco Villa from becoming a bandit to a revolutionary. Yes. In fact, if it hadn't been for Gonzalez, Villa would be a different individual in what we think of him today. That is correct. Yes. One of the more remarkable sites, the Emporium Bar. How in the world does a bar become a historical site? You don't shoot a president in there, so what makes a bar famous? What made this one famous? Well, this bar, the Emporium, was under a famous hotel called the Southern Hotel. And it was a hangout for a lot of spies, pro and con in the Mexican Revolution. It was the most well-known. It offered a, a restaurant. A lot of people came here also to play billiards. And a, a lot of uh, soldiers of fortunes would come in. Uh, a, a lot of people would come in just to have a good time. And especially one occasion, Pancho Villa was drinking a strawberry pop, one of his favorites here at the Emporium. And he was approached by a huertista officer named Claus and Claus offered Villa, you know, look, if you will come and be on the side of Huerta, uh, we're willing to uh, make uh, concessions with you. If you're even willing to help us to try and work with the Germans and even get maybe some submarine bases off near the Gulf of Mexico. And, and, and Villa rejected the offer. He became furious and he walked out of the building. And over here was located another structure called the Roma Hotel. And this is where Villa stayed when he escaped prison on Christmas Day, uh, 1912. And he checked there into the hotel. And from here, he went to reside in a house on Prospect Street. So when Villa uh, came here around early 1913, this is where he resided. This is where he would go eat. This is where he would go shop. He was uh, known to frequent uh, ice cream parlors. Uh, he liked to eat candy, especially peanut brittle. He loved South El Paso Street. So what you're telling me is this was a site in which during the Mexican Revolution, you could have walked in there and you could have seen Mexican revolutionaries. You could have seen American soldiers of fortune. You could have seen Pancho Villa. You could have seen Secret Service agents. Almost everybody was in this place here. This would have been the most intriguing place in El Paso. If it, it makes one want to be able to put a tape recorder in yes. there and listen to those conversations, or uh, to those still, descriptions. Or go in there still, with a video camera. Go in there with a video camera because they were all there. And they were all drinking and they were all having a good time and they were all telling these fabulous stories which for the most part have been lost to history. You're right about that, Leon. It's, it's too bad. We, you and I couldn't have been there that day, Fred, and sit there with a tape recorder and, and just nod our head and occasionally ask a question. <laughs> well, it's kind of ironic. Uh, these historic structures are gone. We have a Burger King now. Uh, this area is saturated with a lot of uh, churches, fried chickens, McDonald's, Taco Bells. Uh, it's a big change. It's a big change, but I'll bet you a dollar, if, if I could prove it, that if Pancho Villa would, was here, the first thing he'd do is get him a big, juicy hamburger. <laughs> We got Paisano and we have Donovan Crossing here. What's the significance of this intersection? This intersection at Paisano and El Paso Street, Paisano before being second, was kind of like the dividing line between Hispanic and Anglo El Paso, and also between South El Paso and downtown El Paso. It always has been like a racial dividing line, even up to this day.
Well, we're, of course, now almost to the bridge, certainly almost to the river. Fred, tell me something about this area right here. This is South El Paso's oldest structure dating back to 1882. It was an old German mercantile store called the Katetzen and Decadu. It later housed the Hotel Orizaba. From 1911 to 1919, Ocean Flipper, the first Negro West Point graduate, resided here. And during that era, before that, Flipper had resided in Chihuahua and he had worked for Albert B. Fall. And in Chihuahua, Flipper started a false rumor that Villa was a descendant of a Negro family. And that, and many reasons, caused Flipper to flee Mexico and reside here in El Paso. Flipper was also a special agent for Senator Albert Bacon Fall. Can you tell me something about that? Yes, I understand he was an agent uh, specifically in mining interests in right. Chihuahua. Actually, he sent reports to A.B. Fall almost every week. There's a stack of his reports on the Mexican Revolution and his, uh, uh, his triumphs and failures and struggles. Uh, I'm speaking of Flipper now, and uh, interesting guy. From here, he went to reside on 3rd Street, not too far from us. Yes. Well, Fred, we're here in South El Paso, and, and can you tell me a little bit about where we're at and what's happened here? We're located in Chihuahuita, the oldest part of El Paso, going back to 1814 when it was settled by Ricardo Bruzuelas. In front of me, the old El Paso Laundry Building was erected in the, eight, in the late 1890s by a man from Liverpool England named Harvey, but the structure served as an observation deck during the Battle of Juarez and many prominent El Pasoans would come here and view the battle. Another popular, even larger observation deck to witness the battle in Juarez was behind the laundry building in a three-story building called El Barco de la Ilusión. Both structures offered a good view of Ciudad Juarez and the many skirmishes. Were, were the streets here then? What was the town? What did the town look like down here where we're at now then? This is South Santa Fe Street. It, it has always been the main corridor from Mexico into the United States. It had a lot of vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic. It was a bustling area. Also here in 1909, Porfirio Diaz came to visit uh, President Taft. Here, the carriage that was uh, carrying him towards downtown stopped, and Fort Bliss officials gave him a 21-gun salute exactly where we're standing right now. During the Taft and the Diaz visit, they, they would have traveled up and down this street behind us in their carriages and wagons, and there would have been thousands of people lining the curb here, watching and shouting and waving and taking pictures. And, and uh, did anything come out of that meeting that, was, uh, that had anything to do with the Mexican Revolution? It was just a cordial diplomatic meeting between Taft and Diaz. Taft kept a low profile and didn't want to mention the Mexican Revolution, but from here, the carriage of Porfirio Diaz went through South El Paso and then downtown. And eventually, they both met at the Chamber of Commerce building on San Francisco Street. But Chihuahuita deserves a lot of historical markers for many different events, including this one, Neil. Fred, can you define Chihuahuita for me? What did it mean and what, uh, what were its boundaries and who lived here? Here in Chihuahuita, during the Mexican Revolution, it sheltered a lot of poor refugees coming out of Chihuahua. What does Chihuahuita mean in English? It means Little Chihuahua. Little Chihuahua. And there's many Chihuahuita barrios throughout the American Southwest, but this is the most historical one of them all. Chihuahuita, or Little Chihuahua, was settled by Ricardo Brusuelas, who received a land grant from Spanish authorities in 1818 and developed a prosperous ranch. 
After 1848, when the Rio Grande became part of the U.S.-Mexico border, new settlers arrived to farm the land. With the coming of the Santa Fe Railroad in 1881, Chihuahuita began to grow dramatically. Soon, a crowded urban area, it was designated the city's first ward in 1887. When the wooden Santa Fe Bridge was built, the area became a major entry point for people and goods from Mexico into the American Southwest. The old Brusuelas land grant eventually became the property of Pedro Garcia, who filed an 1894 claim in a Mexican court that led to the Chamisal land dispute, which was finally settled in 1963. The Mexican Revolution, which began in 1910, brought a surge of refugees north, many to Chihuahuita, and it served as a center of intrigue. It also provided views of the fighting across the Rio Grande. After the revolution, Chihuahuita continued to grow as a gateway to El Paso. At the same time, it became an overcrowded and neglected area, beset with housing and health problems. Renewed interest in the historic neighborhood in the late 20th century resulted in cleanup and rehabilitation efforts. In 1991, the city of El Paso declared Chihuahuita an historic district because of its long and significant history. Today, Chihuahuita is an important reminder of the region's early growth and development. Chihuahuita, what did this area entail? It was like a place that it offered refuge for a lot of uh, people that were fed up with the horrible war conditions going on in Mexico. And we, we sheltered them in our buildings and later tenements were erected here around 1916 to house them. There were two-story brick tenements and there were at least five located behind the laundry building. And a very important figure that settled here briefly around 1915 was a man named Anthony Quinn. He, his father was a Vista officer, and then from here Anthony would move on to Los Angeles, California and become a popular movie star. <laughs> I wonder if he ever came back and visited his old, uh, his old home. Uh, I don't know about that, but what I did know around that time as a youngster, for some reason his father nicknamed him and call him Elephant. Called him Elephant? Yes. <laughs> Father must have had a sense of humor, but you had... <laughs> he had was to... Irish. <laughs> yeah, well, Quinn must have been a big guy too, evidently. Yes. Okay. Was the bridge where it is now? No, it was located about maybe two more blocks further down. The old Santa Fe Bridge, built out of wood, at one time saw a meeting between uh, General Black Jack Pershing and Francisco Villa and General Obregón. Uh, and one time next to it was a army camp, Camp Chicas, erected around 1919. In that year, the, the black infantry uh, Buffalo soldiers participated in trying to catch Pancho Villa. They crossed the bridge, but they were unsuccessful in capturing him. And of course, when we talk about Santa Fe Street, today it's simply an A Street in downtown El Paso, but originally it, it gets its name because it was a street coming out of Mexico going to Santa Fe, and you could have stood here in the early days and watched these wagon caravans of these traders moving back and forth into and out of Mexico between uh, Juarez and Chihuahua City and Santa Fe. It's always been a major transportation corridor before it had a bridge, there was located a ford and then later a ferry to transport people across the river. In my judgment, Santa Fe Street is the most historic street in El Paso. Yes, Leon, along with El Paso Street, both of them can claim a lot of historical significance. All right. Why was El Paso Street called El Paso Street? Because Anson Mills named it that in 1859 when he drew the plat of El Paso. Before that, El Paso Street was called Alameda Street because during that era, a lot of streets in the American Southwest, the principal street was called Alameda Street because it would denote an area also filled with a lot of trees, like an avenida. Fred, right here at this intersection at the corner of Mesa and Overland, back in 1916, occurred one of the greatest racial tragedies in American history. What happened and why? 
A terrible tragedy occurred in Chihuahua at a town called Santa Isabel. A train carrying about 16 American mining engineers affiliated with ASARCO were killed by a Vista general named Pablo Lopez. When the dead bodies arrived in El Paso, a lot of Americans were very upset and wanted revenge. So they congregated here in the downtown area. They first were walking out of saloons and beating up Mexicans in the sidewalks of the street. Uh, then they headed this way and here they were stopped. Or the bridge? Yes, this is Mesa Street now, but this used to be called Utah. Okay. And they were heading south toward the Segundo Barrio and they were crying for revenge and even screaming Let's go down in there and clean them out, meaning the Mexican population in South El Paso. But Mayor Tom Lee placed a barricade of police officers and later they were joined by military officials and they stopped the mob here from entering into the Segundo Barrio. Uh, after the tragedy of the Americans being slammed. Did they, were their bodies brought to El Paso? Yes, they arrived by train here in the middle of January 1916 and they were taken to funeral parlors and most of them incidentally are buried in Evergreen Cemetery right now. Are the graves marked? Yes, they are. I mean marked in the sense of the tragedy or are there just names on them? They're just names but they all have the year 1916 on them. Fred? You're telling me something that in terms of the burial of those 16 victims, I had always heard about it, but I didn't realize that their bodies now lie in Evergreen Cemetery. I would say half of them are located now and the other half were transported outside to El Paso to their original hometown. Were there any further repercussions in terms of this mass killing? Yes, uh, one would be a jail fire that occurred before the raid on Columbus some say that it was probably racially motivated, and one source stipulates that before Villa raided Columbus, he had heard the bad news. And how many people were killed in that jail fire? I've heard up to at least close to 20 people. I'm not too sure, but it was a very horrible way to die inside a jail cell. The streets were lined with ambulances and cars and so on. One of the, probably the greatest tragedy in El Paso's history. Yes, I've heard that people inside the fire became human torches. Yes. What they did in those days, they brought a, a tub of water and a tub of gasoline and they would force the, the, the prisoners to disrobe and hang their clothes and wash their clothes in the gasoline and the water, then hang them on a line and then they had to bathe in it. And they were all supposedly searched, but one of the prisoners lit a cigarette and when he struck that match, the whole jail exploded and flames and death everywhere. What a tragedy. Leon, that's one of many motives that led Francisco Villa to raid the border town of Columbus. Okay, Fred, why don't we go on down the street to the Capos building where, as I understand it, the revolution was actually planned at that, uh, at that, in that structure. Let's go check it out. All right. Fred, over here on my right, we have the Capels Building, one of the most historic buildings with relation to the Mexican Revolution. What happened here? This was a second location of the Office of the Agency for the Provisional Government of Mexico. The Junta was composed of Abraham Gonzalez, Castulo Herrera, Alberto Fuentes, Federico Garza and others, and they plan for the Battle of Juarez here and for the eventual overthrow of Porfirio Diaz. They were located on the fifth floor, which was at that time the highest floor in, in 1911. Then later, it's the same floor now with the broken window, right? Yes. That's where they were, where they were housed. By 1919, the upper two stories were added. But also in this structure, it housed the offices of Dr. Ira Jefferson Bush, 
who was commissioned the medical surgeon for Francisco Madero. There was a book about him called Gringo Doctor. Yes, that was his popular nickname. Yes. And he was also involved in smuggling a lot of arms and ammunition. He was well known for smuggling the old cannon called the Blue Whistler. Yes. And it eventually ended up in Ojinaga, and they used it at the battle there. And they also utilized it in the Battle of Juarez, and they later returned it in a big celebration to the city of El Paso, and they placed it over there at the old City Hall Plaza. Fred, during the Mexican Revolution, it primarily, initially at least, centered in Juarez. And the revolutionaries then were part of a junta. In other words, they had their leadership. And their leadership met here in the Capels building. And what happened? What kind of plans did they make up there? What, uh, what did they put together? They put a plan that would lead to the eventual overthrow of Porfirio Diaz, starting with the successful victory of the Battle of Juarez in May 1911. After that battle, by two weeks, Porfirio Diaz was on a train going into exile in Europe. And it all started on the fifth floor of this building, or at least yes. from our perspective. Yes. It also involved people like Castro Herrera, Braulio Hernandez, Federico Gonzalez Garza, who was, and Alberto who was, Fuentes. All right, who was Hernandez? Bra, Bra, Braulio, am I pronouncing yes, it right? Braulio. Hernandez. Now, who was he? Braulio was from the state of Chihuahua, and he served under Madero, and then he turned against Madero, and then he served under Pascual Orozco, and then he got dissatisfied with him, and he took many sides during the revolution, but he was primarily a financial agent in the beginning for Francisco Madero. All right, now who was Francisco Madero? He is considered uh, the main man that toppled Porfirio Diaz. He was a wealthy asandado from the state of Coahuila in Mexico, and he got dissatisfied with the Diaz regime, and he was the one that started the movement to topple him. You know, Fred, the Mormon culture has been strong in, in El Paso and actually indeed around the Southwest, but nevertheless, there were problems with owning more than one wife. The authorities frowned on it, the church, other churches frowned on it. As a result, there was a Mormon exodus in New Mexico with several communities being set up down there. But still, during the Mexican Revolution, not Villa, but some of the other groups uh, in particular resented the Mormons, they wanted their homes, they wanted their money, so they had a great rep the Mormon exodus. Roughly 4,000 men, women, and children left their homes, left their farms, left their orchards, caught the train into El Paso, and, and lived here in various areas around the Southwest. But, this was very strong in the Mormon, uh, in Mormon history, this area here. Uh, what was that? In 1912, this housed the Mormon refugee office headed by Orson Brown. Here is where they helped the refugees get resettled in the El Paso area. The Red Flag Army of Pascual Orozco created this exit. This was a revolutionary army? Yes. Okay. They walked several hundred miles to the U.S. border and they boarded a train near the Columbus. The refugees did, okay. And Hachita and they came to the Union Depot and here Mayor Charles Kelly supplied them with a lot of clothing. Uh, the Red Cross was in there to help them out. The U.S. War Department donated at least $3,000 for the refugees. And it was the second largest exodus of refugees to the El Paso area. The first being in 1914 when Pancho Villa forced at least 10,000 refugees here to the El Paso area. And did they remain here? Did they ever go back to Mexico? They remained here for less than a year and some were resettled in Arizona and Utah settlements. Didn't some of them go return to Mexico though? Yes, in less than a year they were back in Chihuahua. Back in Chihuahua, yes. And this was a, what, a, a refugee office here? On the top floor of the refugee office, 
this being their second location, they had been in another one previously. Fred, we're on the northwest corner of Mesa and Texas Street, and this used to be a, an ice cream parlor. And one of the unique things about Pancho Villa was that he loved ice cream. So why was he here, who was he with, and, and what happened? Pancho Villa was known to have a sweet tooth. And one thing that he enjoyed was chocolate-covered baseball ice creams. And the elite confectionery inaugurated here in March of 1911 offered that to Villa and a lot of followers of Francisco Madero. In this photograph, we can witness Pascual Orozco right here and Francisco Villa. The ice cream baseballs, except for Villa and some of the others, did everybody in town call those things ice cream baseballs? I would imagine they did. Uh, ice cream, the chocolate covered ice creams were known throughout the nation. It was not just a fad here in El Paso. This is possibly the last photograph ever taken of Orozco and Villa together, that being in 1911. And then in 1912, they would both become enemies. They would split and go their separate ways. Orozco, in particular, felt shortchanged by Madero. He wanted to be governor of Chihuahua, and instead Madero recognized Abraham Gonzalez. He also felt, since after the Battle of Juarez, he called for the killing of Juan Navarro, the federal commander. He called for his uh, execution and Madero refused. And then after that, they had a big fallout. Fred, you're El Paso's greatest historian. And frankly, you've led us on a great tour of downtown El Paso. and. Let's go have a drink. Okay, it's my pleasure, Leon. El Paso Gold, El Paso Gold Best story ever been told We love our desert mountains Where we get El Paso Gold El Paso's in the mountains And the mountains are in our souls We got the Lone Star of Texas El Paso gold. Yes, the gold is in these mountains, birthplace of our souls. And the gold is in the people in the city of El Paso. 
El Paso Gold, El Paso Gold. Best story ever been told. We love our desert mountains when we get El Paso Gold. All can find some peace of mind if they look where they are told. We look to our mountains. El Paso Gold. The gold is in the sunsets. Their beauty is so bold. Come and see it for yourself. Find El Paso Gold. El Paso Gold. El Paso Gold. Best story ever been told. Of our desert mountains, where we get El Paso gold. No one has the gold like ours here from days of old. But we will share our mountain there if you seek El Paso gold. The beauty here grows with the day, the lights both young and old. We never will grow tired to share our El Paso gold. El Paso gold, El Paso gold. Best story ever been told. We love our desert mountains where we get El Paso gold. The Spaniards could not see our gold. They wanted the metal kind. They missed the best part of their journey when the gold was on their mind. Our gold is in the sunsets, for their beauty is so bold. Come and see it for yourself and find El Paso gold. El Paso Gold, El Paso Gold Best story ever been told We love our desert mountain Where we get El Paso Gold We love our desert mountains Where we get El Paso Gold